Our second speaker uh, will be Mary Sharif, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Did I say that? Like yes. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mary teaches, amongst other things, uh, uh, biomedical law at, in our Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba. Mary, I'd like to start by not necessarily posing a question, but just putting it to you that um, physician assisted suicide, assisted suicide is a crime in Canada today, but um, Peter and I were chatting earlier. I don't know of a single doctor in Canada who's ever spent one, even one day in jail for hastening the death of a patient, although all of us know that it happens, maybe not every day, but quite frequently. And indeed, of the people who've been charged with uh, mercy killing and, and physician assisted suicide, probably fewer than a single handful has ever spent a day in jail. They're, they're either downcharged to administering a noxious substance, and they're either the jury acquits, even though the evidence is strongly in favor of conviction. It kind of looks as if the reality on the ground, de facto, you you uh, you aren't likely to experience the teeth of the law biting into your rear end, <clears throat> unless you're one of the unlucky very few who who where discretion is exercised to charge you to charge you with a serious crime, and then a jury or a judge decides to convict you and send you to jail rather than giving you a conditional sentence or. Uh, suspended sentence or, or something like that. So we're all waiting in, uh, with interest to see what the Supreme Court does, but it kind of looks as if society and its values have marched ahead and have almost made the decision for us because the doctor who assisted Sue Rodriguez to die was never charged, never mind convicted or, or sent to prison. What do you think? Well, um what do I think? I think that I don't know that it's uh, an issue of society marching ahead. I think that that's probably always existed to a certain extent. Um, so what we need is, is more research, more discussion, more robust discussion, more transparency um, with respect to what people are doing and the decisions people are making. Um, so I don't know that it's a change. I think that it's probably always been around um, based on what I've looked at anyway. Good. All right, so um, some of the research, um, well first of all I've been looking at the uh, assisted death issue through a legal lens for approximately six years and um, some of the research that I've been uh, doing has been looking very closely at the different laws in different jurisdictions that have legalized assisted death um, and in particular I've been looking uh, for answers to the following questions. How are these laws the same? Sorry. How are these laws different? What's the scope and reach of these laws? And if the scope and reach of these laws are different, why is that the case? And I wanted to look at these uh, questions in great detail um, because in discussions and debate about legalization of assisted death, we frequently hear and use the term dying with dignity. So I wonder what does dying with dignity actually mean from a legal perspective. So in other words, I wanted to know how this concept of dying with dignity and the concept of dignity, how that was being translated by law. And what does it technically mean then at the end of the legal day? So does dignity mean simply autonomy and the right to choose or does it mean something else? And if it only means autonomy, then this is a very powerful concept. And legally then, how could the law, if it only means autonomy, how can the law then properly restrain the practice of uh, assisted death and keep it within a very narrow scope? So anecdotally, I knew that uh, dying with dignity couldn't possibly have only one definition, uh, legally speaking, because the handful of jurisdictions that have actually passed assisted uh, death legislation um, do vary and there are differences in scope. So why is that the case? Why is it the case if all of these laws are premised on dying with dignity? Why would these laws be different? So tonight I want to share with you some of the uh, things that I've learned about the assisted death laws that I've looked at in the jurisdictions that have passed express uh, assisted death legislation 
and then I want to talk a, a little bit about how what's going on there. Well, thanks. Thank you. I feel like this thing is like right in my nose, but that's okay. It's a refreshment time. Um, so I want to uh, share some of these ideas and sort of explain then what um, what's going on in these other jurisdictions a little bit and talk about how what's going on in those jurisdictions and how that impacts or how that connects to what's going on here in Canada. Okay. So for uh, what I'm going to talk about now, I'm going to use two definitions. First of all, I'll talk about euthanasia. And for tonight's purposes, euthanasia would mean lethal injection by a physician at the request of a voluntary and a competent patient. Uh, assisted suicide uh, would be the prescribing of lethal medication to a patient at the patient's request. Uh, the patient is competent and voluntary, again, but the patient would self-administer the lethal medication. Okay. So the first category of assisted death legislation is legislation that permits both euthanasia, so lethal injection, and assisted suicide, so self-administration, for patients who have unbearable suffering with no reasonable solution to cure that suffering. This is the model of assisted death that we see in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. So I call this the Benelux model, okay? Now a couple of points here. While euthanasia and assisted suicide are both permitted in those jurisdictions, euthanasia is the more common practice and it is actually the preferred practice, euthanasia, lethal injection. Secondly, with respect to suffering, while irremediable suffering must connect to a recognized medical disease or disorder, suffering can either be physical or non-physical. So that means it could include psychological, but again, it has to be connected to a medical condition, a medical disorder. Okay, so that's the model that's present. There's some variations, but present in Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And those jurisdictions are very close together geographically. Okay, they're in a very small geographic space. Um, now, all of these three pieces of law were passed through uh, the respective legislatures in those jurisdictions. But it's worth noting that Netherlands was the first uh, jurisdiction to pass the legislation. And the Netherlands had a lengthy history in the practice of euthanasia for patients who were suffering from uh, a medical condition. Um, now that practice did not evolve or is not grounded or originally was not grounded on autonomy. It was actually grounded on the concept of a physician conflict of duties. So the two duties that the phys physician had that came into conflict in order to sort of develop this concept of euthanasia, and Arthur's listened carefully, is the uh, duty to protect life and the duty to relieve suffering. And physicians found themselves in certain circumstances with certain patients that their, uh, their duty to protect life could come into conflict with the duty to relieve suffering because the protecting of life too far was actually increasing suffering of the patients. So physicians found themselves in the position of necessity. Now I'm, uh, this is basically the, the legal construction, okay? So in the position of necessity, then the physician had to make a choice. And so the choice then could be euthanasia to relieve the suffering of the patient. Um, So although these laws in these three jurisdictions are actually structurally very similar, allowing euthanasia or assisted suicide for the suffering patient, they, they, they have been developed differently. The Dutch law again attaches to this necessity thing, um, whereas the Belgium and Luxembourg laws then developed, created a very similar law to the Netherlands. Um, but developed primarily on the basis of the right to choose and autonomy. So this is why we see the, a tighter connection between a medical condition in the uh, Netherlands experience and the Dutch experience than we do, say, for example, in the Belgium experience, which, which is what we've been seeing in the news lately. We see, we've seen in the news where in Belgium we've seen euthanasia for uh, deaf, uh, two brothers who are deaf who had a progressive and degenerative uh, 
disease and they were going to be going blind, so they were given euthanasia. And we've also, at the request of course, and we've also seen the case of, I think it's Nancy Verhelst, uh, who received euthanasia for psychological suffering after uh, botched uh, sex change operations. So the laws are the same, but they have same doctor for both. Uh, laws are similar, but we see a little bit more of an expansion of the scope of the law within Belgium. And I think that relates to how the laws actually emerged. Almost done. So, now let's compare this to the United States. Three states of Oregon, uh, Washington and Vermont, passed legislation in 1997, 2008, and 2013 this year, respectively, so Vermont is this year. The dying with dignity legislation in the United States is almost identical, but it only permits assisted suicide for uh, patients who have been died, uh, who have a prognosis of less than six months to live, six months or less to live, okay? And they have to self-administer the medication, so it's only assisted suicide for six months or less to live. Now, a key difference, again, between these states is how the legislation came into being. The two states, Oregon and Washington, passed legislation by ballot initiative. I'll explain about that in a minute. Whereas Vermont actually passed the legislation through its legislature. This is interesting because two of the major criticisms of the American laws uh, by proponents of assisted death are firstly that if the American laws only allow assisted suicide, not euthanasia, it means that assisted suicide is not available to people who may be suffering equally but who are not able to self-administer the medication. Secondly, uh, assisted suicide under the American regime then would be unavailable to persons who might also be suffering equally but, but who don't have that diagnosis of six months or less to live. So those criticisms are, are uh, advanced against the American uh, legislation. Now a ballot initiative, which is how uh, the legislation was passed in Oregon and Washington, um, is a vote by the people. And that can pretty much avoid having to respond to those inconsistencies or conflicting messages in the legislation. But a legislative debate really cannot do that. It has to tackle them. So although Vermont legislation proceeded um, through the legislature with the same assisted suicide model, basically, as Oregon and Washington, you can see how such a model, a narrow model, assisted suicide for someone six months or less to live, is going to be vulnerable to equality rights arguments, for example. Right. Right. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Good point. So, this is why when we get into the Canadian court debate, right, and the dialogue, um, or for that matter, even the Quebec legislation and the discussion in the Quebec National Assembly, that we see not the emergence of an American type system, the assisted suicide system for six months or less to live, we see the emergence of uh, a dialogue around a Benelux type system, euthanasia, plus maybe assisted suicide, um, for people who are suffering, suffering, the suffering cannot be cured, but it's for a wide, potentially a wider scope than somebody who's at the very terminal stages of end of life, that six month time frame. Um, now, at the same time, though, Canada is arguably, and the argument has been made, is more culturally similar, though, to the United States. Um, so, this has, uh, the United States has been described then, when they've proceeded in those three states with assisted suicide, is uh, described as a do-it-yourself kind of culture, or a consumerist culture. Um, so, assisted suicide is a better fit, if you'll pardon that language, or excuse me for using that language, uh, with Americans than, say, in Asia. So, based on um, um, what is currently being discussed in Canada, that narrower model, if it were to be implemented in Canada, would immediately then see uh, discussion and debate and constitutional challenges based on equality rights and things of that nature. Um, so that is why we're seeing then in the case, in the Quebec legislature, that much broader Benelux model. But we have to think about culturally, what is it that Canadians actually want? And so what has to happen here is a much broader, deeper discussion and more information and more understanding about what it is that's happening, happening legally in all these other jurisdictions and not glossing over the differences, but actually looking very carefully at the, dis the differences. Um, and I think that's basically all I wanted to say. <laughs>